Hello, everyone. This is Ted Check, Social Media Manager for the International Foundation for Protection Officers. I'm here with Dr. Glenn Kitteringham. Uh, Glenn, how you doing? It's uh, it's great to to finally meet you. Uh, we I've written about you uh, in uh, on the IFPO website, but uh, it's great to finally meet you and and uh, and have a conversation with you. How you doing? Good, thank you. Um, likewise, great. Yeah, great. Doing well. Can't complain. All things yeah. considering, with the pandemic. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I, I think we're all just doing what you know. It's it, as as people say, it's the new normal, and we're all just doing what we can. Um, I've been in my basement here. Um, Chuck Andrews was, was nice enough to get me this, uh, this backdrop and I've got the, uh, the shirt, so, uh, I'm good to go, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I, I wanted to talk about, uh, um, you, you've done a lot of things in the industry. So I wanted to, to talk about, uh, briefly, you know, um, how you got your start in security and, and what ma motivated you to do so. Well, um, like so many people, um, my original intent was to get into law enforcement. And, uh, but I, so I went to school. I, I went to Mount Royal College at the time. It's a university now, but I, I enrolled in their criminology program. And I, uh, one of my coworkers was working loss prevention at the Hudson's Bay Company, which is a, a retailer here in Canada. And they were looking for loss prevention officers. So uh, I, I got a job part time. I thought it would, uh, you know, look good on my resume, so to speak. And so I finished college and, but at the time there was a hiring freeze on and, and the law enforcement, this was in the early nineties and there was just law enforcement was not hiring anywhere. Or if they were like, you know, they were, you know, they were having 3000 applicants for 15 positions. Wow. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I put all that on hold and I thought I'd wait until the, this freeze this hiring freeze thought out. But at the same time, I, after working in the, in, uh, I worked for two years loss prevention and then a full-time position came up as an internal investigator. So investigating theft and fraud of employee uh, by employees. And so I took that position and that's when I started to realize that there was a, a, a career potential within the security industry. And so by the time uh, law enforcement started hiring again in numbers, uh, I had lost all interest in it and I came to realize it was not the job that I thought it was and um, saw that there was lots and lots of opportunity within the security industry. And so, so I just worked, I went from position to position, you know, two years loss prevention, four years internal investigator. I worked as a insurance fraud investigator for a little while. I did not like that at all. Hmm. I didn't like doing, you know, covert surveillance work or anything. Uh, I just, I, it's totally overrated. You know, when you're, when you do an insurance fraud investigation, you're sitting in a van in the summertime, it's basically a uh, oversized sweat box. And in the well, winter you can't time, have it running, right? You can't have the AC on. I guess. Right. And in the winter time, you can't have the heater running. And so you're sitting there freezing your butt off. Hmm. And it's just, I, I found that that, you know, that, that myth that they show on TV of people doing surveillance work, that wears thin after about 10 minutes. <laughs> and uh, so I lost, I mean, I did that for a while. Uh, I mean, I did some other things. I did some other investigations working for this company, but um, quite frankly, they made promises to me that they ultimately didn't keep because they eventually told me because that I didn't have a law enforcement background that there was only certain functions I was capable of doing. And hmm. that's the first real, real experience I had that, that I, that I came up against that that's very prevalent in this industry is that it seems that lots of these government retirees, whether they're law enforcement, military or whoever are dictating to the rest of us, what we are capable of doing, hmm. which I completely reject. And to be perfectly honest, um, it's my experience that the vast majority of the, what I refer to these government retirees have limited security understanding or education, and quite frankly, are doing a huge disservice for the entire industry, and they're keeping it from progressing. They take jobs they're not, they're not qualified to take. Um, they seem to think that they can dictate what the rest of us should be capable of doing, and I, I, um, I reject that. And one of the things that I found that, that, um, counters that is education. And so I, I got an, on an education bandwagon. So at the same time, 
when I was going, you know, working through my career, I also pr pursued as much education as I could. That's, and, that's a great uh, idea. Yeah. And, um, like that's the, that counteracts that what I, what I refuse is that nonsense that you have to have a law enforcement or military background. Like that's, that is utter, utter nonsense. And, and you know that, uh, Glenn, if I could just, um, say something here that, that actually makes sense with what, uh, I was talking to Tom Conley who, uh, you know, serves on the board at the IFPO and, and has his own security company here in, um, in the United States. And, and he was saying, almost the same thing. Like he, he has great relationships with local law enforcement, but uh, at the same time, he, he stays in his lane, they stay in theirs. And, yep. and he jokes with them. He says, Hey, look, I, I'm not going to, I won't play cop and you don't play a security expert. Okay. Right. And I say the same thing. And I, I've said, I've said to these people, Hey, I am no more a military expert or a law enforcement expert than you are a security expert. So why don't you do your job and I'll do mine and go. stop trying to tell me, how to do my job when you don't know how to do my job. And um, so anyway, I, you know, I embraced the whole education um, issue of ed education. And so I, you know, the Bay in two different jobs, I worked as a, you know, as an insurance fraud investigator for a while. I went and worked as, you know, as a contract guard uh, at a variety of sites for a relatively short period of time. And that led me to working for a property management company where I was, you know, I went from, guard to supervisor to site supervisor they hired me in house as a manager i ended up staying there for 13 years i left as their director of security for uh, security and life safety for western canada i was also co-responsible for their national program quite frankly their national program was based on the work that i did because eastern canada didn't have my counterpart and so they modeled their eastern counterpart on the work that i did hmm. And then in, well, I'd started up my first consultancy in 2004, where I was mostly doing writing and research. And then I took the plunge in 2010 and uh, decided to do it full time. And at the same time, I was going to school. I, you know, I, I, uh, I, I'm just a huge believer in education and training. And if we are ever to become a, a profession, that's the way, like it has to be through education training. We're not, there's no way right now that we can be considered a profession. We're just not. Um, any, anybody can come into this industry and claim any kind of expertise. And there's, there's very few people to, to challenge them on that. And like, there's no, there's limited credentials. There's nothing mandatory other than frontline security personnel, which I find truly bizarre how is it that frontline people have to take training and yet their bosses don't how, how is that possible wow. how is that possible that chief security officer requires no training whatsoever um well shouldn't he have already gone through everything that that, that well should have but but a lot of these positions are the, are taken by what i refer to as these government retirees because they're taking advantage of what i refer to as a societal myth that if somehow if you've worked for the government in some kind of enforcement um, function, that somehow that you become a security expert. Mm. And that, that's just not the case. And I have had many, many, many of these people admit to me they have no idea what they're doing. And uh, wow, just, that's an issue. <laughs> well, I find it so unethical. Like it's just so unethical that people are taking jobs that they're not qualified for. And um, so anyway, um, at the same time, you know, the, you know, I took various university courses, certificates and everything from business management and accounting and human relations and human resources to security. And um, I, I've been on a I've been on an adult learning certif certificate kick the last 10 years. Wow. I've taken that's, a that's number great. of a number of certificates in adult learning and workplace learning and e-learning. Um, I obtained my master's a degree in security and risk management from the University of uh, Leicester in the UK, uh, 99 to 2001. I got my CPP designation from ASIS in 2002. Um, and then just kept taking other certificates and, and branched more and more into management and leadership and, and um, uh, just, just took a variety of, of certificates. The, meanwhile, the whole time I was working Mm -hmm. And then I decided after about 10 years of contemplation to get my doctorate. 
and I finally realized that if I had put as much intellectual energy into thinking about getting my doctorate as actually getting my doctorate, I could have probably gotten it three times over. <laughs> so in 2012, I finally made the decision that by 2013, that I was going to get my, like I was going to be enrolled in a program somewhere. Mm -hmm. And so I, I started doing research and I found about, found out about the University of Portsmouth. They had a doctoral program there and I enrolled in four years and I did it. Oh, that's, that's fantastic. Yeah. And, and <clears throat> I, uh, I finished it. I took a little bit of time off and then I took it, I took another certificate in adult learning and now I'm finding my interests are really lying because of the learning and, and the mentoring and the leadership. Um, I'm actually enrolled in two certificates right now. One is in um, strategic management and the other one is in change management. Hmm. And uh, I'm just, you know, as I, I get more and more involved in leadership and mentoring and development I, I just find that my interest in all these areas is, is just continuing to grow. And there is a, I think there's a real lack of leadership in today's business world. Um, and I, I also think that, well, I think a lot of things, but I, I, <laughs> I also think that employees need, we're, we're, we are living in an information era, right? You know? People, whether they want to or not, people are going to have to accept the fact that, that, that continue for, if you want to get ahead, you probably need to consider that you're probably going to have to be in school for the rest of your life at on one level or another. Student. Yes. And yeah. I'm not talking about full-time university. I mean, I've, I've, I, I've got a, a real problem with a lot of universities. I, I don't think they're teaching people how to think anymore. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of these kids coming out of university are brainwashed and, uh, and they've lost that ability to critically think and that, and that's really, I always thought that's why you go. That's, that's yeah. why you go to college or university. Not so much for, for what they are saying, but, it, but it, or what they're teaching, but it's the method. You learn how to learn, really. I think, at least for me, that was, I, I learned how it is that I take in information and, and use it. Right. I more than anything. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and I don't just blame the universities uh, solely. I mean, part of the problem is, is that, you know, with the, we're seeing some major societal changes where we're seeing smaller and smaller families and, and, and more often than not, you're just seeing, seeing single child households now. And parents are now treating their children like their friends and their, their best friends. And there's quite frankly, a lot of these people are being spoiled. And um, then they're being sent off to university. The universities are catering to these people in every way possible. And um, then again, the, you know, you've got this political correctness this, that's just sweeping across the, you know, the West. And, and it's stifling diversity. It's stifling discussion about anything, any kind of difference of opinions. And, right. and again, these kids are just, they're just being brainwashed and they just, so many of them have lost the ability to think. And they're, they're, they're like, you know, what we've referred to this as outrage culture. They're outraged about everything. Mm. And um, they've just, they've lost the ability to think and critically think. And I say it all, you know, I mean, I teach for two different universities myself, so maybe I'm part of the problem. I'd like to think <laughs> I'm not. But I also have a lot of my own courses. And the one thing more than anything that is I'm, I, I expose my students to a lot of different concepts and a lot of different content. But at the end of the day, I always tell everybody, you know what, you got to look into this stuff yourself and you got to figure out for yourself what to think. And don't don't listen to me. Um, like read a book, read, read a whole bunch of books, watch videos and um, like weigh the way weigh out the facts and opinions on, on, on all sides and then come to your own conclusion. Don't just jump on the bandwagon. And also I'm sure you've seen the studies that they talk about one of the biggest problems with social media is that they've actually acknowledged the like button and what it does, you know, the like button on, on, um, you know, whether it's Facebook or whatever, Yeah. it's um, you know, you give somebody the, a, a like or a thumbs up, 
they've actually proven that that, that actually it encourages group think because uh, people don't want to, like, if they don't want to like something, they're being called out. Why aren't you liking this? You, are you telling me that you're not in favor of this? And, right. and so it's, in, it's, it's so encouraging. It's shaming that's involved. It is. There is a lot of shaming. And, and I find it absolutely stunning that companies are being bullied by these anonymous people on the internet who they, we don't even know who they are. Mm. Oh, the Twitter and, mob. Yeah, they, they just, in my mind, a bunch of pathetic losers who, who just are like, who are, who, are, who are successfully influencing all kinds of actions that with the threat of, well, we're going we're gonna to call you racist if you don't support us. We're going to, like, they, 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 they name and shame all the time and they, like, right. they just bully everybody. Cancel and we don't culture. even know who these people yeah. are. Doxing and cancel culture, right? Yeah, and just like the, it's just unbelievable that we like that we allow this to happen. And uh, so, I'm I'm hoping that the pendulum is going to start swinging the other way, where people are going to start thinking independently. And there are there are a lot of great independent thinkers out there. And mm -hmm. I and watch. I think oh, go ahead, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, no, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was going to say I I think um, you know. I think now there's an there's an awareness of of all this this cancel culture and, and doxing and all that stuff. So so it's kind of the, the jig is up. Like it it's no longer hidden. Right. It's no longer covert. So so you know, knowing is half the battle, as they say. So so we, we're aware of it now. It's now it's the question of are we gonna do anything about it? Right. Are we, what are we gonna do to counter it? Yeah, yeah. And you know, there's a lot of really good stuff on YouTube. And I'm finding, like, I've lost, personally, I've lost faith in mainstream media. I really have. Mm -hmm. I, um, I think they're failing. They're failing us. They're not calling these groups out. They are just perpetuating a lot of stereotypes and myths. And they are either because they've been infiltrated by these politically correct people coming out of universities or if right. they're just chasing the chasing the uh the the money um like the the marketing and and you know like the, again they you know they want everybody to to conform but i've i've lost all respect for mainstream media they just like the moment i start reading stuff and you start seeing these buzz they, these buzzwords it just to me it means that these people are like even these reporters are just not thinking anymore they're just regurgitating garbage that they, either they've they've been talking points um, yeah and so but what i'm finding where where the real where you can really find out about what's going on in the world is on youtube hmm. you've got what you what i would call these citizen reporters you know right the new media yeah, the, the new media. And there is some absolutely amazing content being created. And I mean, I don't agree with everything that I see. Of course not. But what I am doing is I'm looking at a whole bunch of different content from all different aspects. And I'm what I'm trying to do is figure out for myself and make up my own mind and not just join the mob. Sure, sure. And, you know, you know whether it's... Uh, you know, whether it's Joe Rogan, I'll, you know, I've, I watched lots of his podcasts, you know, all three hours of them um, or a five minute clip uploaded by some by somebody. There's a lot of really great stuff on there. And I, the other thing I'm finding is that I'm seeing stuff on YouTube that either will be picked up by mainstream media days, weeks or months later mm. or, or it's never being picked up. And it just, the, yeah. you know, anybody with a camera and it's on our phones, they can just record stuff. And, sure. and again, I get it. They, you know, we all have opinions and we're certainly all allowed our opinions. And I am a firm believer that your opinion is just as important as my opinion is, but it's no more important than my opinion. Mm. And uh, again, you know, I, I think we need to open up and, and get our, information from a whole bunch of different sources before we we make it you know make our minds up about some things hey glenn you know there's one thing i wanted to go back to and um you know when we talked about your background uh you you had the uh, uh the pleasure of working with ron minion who yes. founded the ifpo in 1988 maybe you could tell us just a little bit about that about uh, about your time with 
with Ron? Sure. Well, so I, I, I went to work for Ron in 1990. And um, just a little bit about Ron prior to Minion Protection Service. And so IFPO formed in, in the late 80s, as you said. Uh, but he had, a, he had a contract guard company before that called Base Fort Protection. And he ran that for several years. And I don't know the full history of Base Fort, but he ran that for several years. And then he sold the company. And he had a non-compete clause that he had to, uh, like, obviously not compete in the, in the industry with the company that bought his company. So uh, he left the province for a while and then came back. And then, you know, the first thing he did when he came back and when his non-compete clause terminated or ended as he set up Minion Protection Service. And uh, so I worked for Ron out at actually Spruce Meadows. And uh, so he formed, so IFPO was formed in 88. Right. So I got my, he convinced me to get my certified protection officer designation. Oh, great, great. And so I wrote, I started studying that in 1991. And by the time I, and I, and I, I passed it in 1991, but interestingly enough, uh, so I wrote the fourth edition. So from nine, I assume in 88, when he, when he wrote the first edition, there was already a fourth edition by 1991. Hmm. And, uh, and gotcha. so, yeah, I worked for Ron for, for uh it was over the summer when i it was between my first and second year when i was at mount royal and i i actually worked for him and at the bay at the exact same time so but i worked for him for several months and i you know um i i knew ron right up until his untimely passing in 2008 i think mm -hmm. um but known him you know continue to be friends and ultimately he actually worked for me ironically um i worked for him when he was he had security personnel at a building here in town in calgary and they hired me in-house to be the manager and so i went from being one of his employees to the next day he became basically one of my vendors ah okay wow how about that <laughs> and so he worked for you know we had that we had that relationship I can't remember for five years, six years. And it was Ron, you know what I mean? Ron, Ron was a great guy. He, he was a, he was a big believer in education and training. He was a big believer in the, the, um, the professionalization of the security industry. And the reason that I, I firmly believe that we are not a profession, just doing a bit of a segue here. Yeah. So there's two definitions of the word profession. The first definition of that word is that if you get paid to do something that makes you a professional. Okay, well, lots of people get paid to do lots of things that are pretty creepy and pretty slimy. Um, you know, drug dealers sell drugs. Does that make them a professional? Well, according to that definition, yes. But my question yeah. is, well, do we want to align ourselves with that definition? Uh, the second definition of, a, of, a, of the word professional is that you have to be a member of a profession. In order for you to be a member of a profession, you have to meet several criteria. And one of them is that you need to have a specific body of knowledge. Another one is that you have to have, um, you know, a, a considerable period of training. Um, the third, third is that you have to have certification. You have to be able to prove to your peers that you are a subject matter expert in your chosen field. Okay. And the third, the fourth level or the fourth, I mean, there's, there's lots of, I mean, the, Criteria for the level of, or for the definition of, of uh, professions, you know, range is all over the place, but I use these four. So the fourth one is that if you are somewhat self-managed and that you can revoke a license. So um, yes, in the security industry, we have security guard licenses, but our security industry, we can't revoke that license. We can't say to somebody, we don't think you're qualified anymore to work in this industry not the way the you know the medical association or or the legal profession self-manages and self-polices so there's no governing body no no for, for the entire industry right and so like our governing body let's say in alberta is a solicitor general's office but like but 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 all they do is they grant licenses and that's because you you write an exam but but we don't have licensing for security managers or for corporate security people like and and again i find it i find it truly bizarre that uh, in so many jurisdictions 
you know, frontline security personnel are required to obtain training and yet their bosses aren't. I, 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 I'd love, I'd love it if somebody could explain that contradiction to me. Hmm. So, so anyway, um, th that's the, for me, that's the four criteria of a profession. Okay. We do have a body of knowledge. Sorry. So, so therefore the, the security industry is not a profession or no i mean we have a body of knowledge but it's but it's any training that we obtain other than frontline security personnel is strictly optional right you can take the training or not but there's nothing stopping anybody from being a ditch digger and there's nothing wrong with ditch digging but being a ditch digger one day and setting up shop as a security expert the next day and telling everybody you're a security expert. And when you say, well, how are you a security expert? Well, cause I said I was like, because they don't have to take training. They, they don't have to prove to anybody that they're qualified in any way, shape or form. So I, I follow the second definition of professionalism and we are not a profession in no way, shape or form are we a profession. So, so anyway, going back to Ron. Yeah. I mean, I, I worked for Ron and had, had you know, um, I worked for Ron, he worked for me and this, that, 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 I guess you could say that really, that professional relationship lasted for probably 10 years, almost 10 years. And, uh, you know, I became a member of IFPO, um, and I, you know, I've had an ongoing relationship with IFPO for 15, 18 years now. And I got my CSSM, I got my Certified Protection Officer Instructor designation. You know, I've written for the magazine. I've done training on their behalf. Um, I'm launching a webinar series in, in January. To, oh, that's great. Uh, geared, geared towards frontline security personnel. And uh, I, I do see IFPO as the, as they have, the, I mean, they're, they're there now, but I think, I think they've got a lot more potential. Like I, I see. Great. I, I, I hope I can, you know, do what I can. And I know there's other people that are, that are uh, doing the same to kind of elevate that, uh, you know, their, their footprint uh, out there in the world. You know, we've, we, um, yeah. We well, we're, you know, the, I don't know, like the research that IFPO is interested in, in funding on basically security guard duties and job task analysis. I think that's, you know, they're in the middle of a fundraising event, uh, right. fundraising at this point. It's going to be led by perpetuity research. Uh, in yes. The and I am, uh, like, I, I don't, nobody's, um, like, to a certain extent, we do know what security officers do. I, uh, I did my doctoral thesis on whether the Alberta basic security training program prepares people for work in the security industry back in 2014, 2015, 2016, roughly. Mm -hmm. and, but one of the things that I did look at was training programs all over the world. And uh, I did a comparative analysis of about 35 different training programs. And, uh, you know, I looked at a number of sources and, you know, the academics have got there's been some academic work into what security personnel do. The government certainly haven't have some understanding of what security personnel do as part of their uh, national occupation research. Um, most governments around the world have uh, working with their, like in Canada, it's human resource development Canada, but what they do is, you know, these, these organizations are basically responsible for categorizing all jobs in a country. Because what they want to do is, you know, they want to help prepare the workforce for work and people for the workforce. And so they categorize all, like all jobs in the country and what, what do they do? What education do they require? That sort of thing. So governments are certainly familiar with that. The security industry is certainly has an understanding of what, security officers are required to do. Uh, but, the, you know, I think we will be successful in, in um, or IFPO will be successful in raising the funds necessary to, to, to um, get the research going. Right. This will, you know, 
this will, I think this will be some unique research. We're looking at security personnel all over the world and what they do, but more importantly is the job task analysis and, and how complex are the duties of security personnel? You know, yeah, um, yeah. I'm very interested on the face value or on the face of it. Yeah. And I, I, I don't think, I don't think, um, people have a true appreciation of how complex security work is. I think, I think it's incredibly complex, complex, whether you're talking about a frontline security officer or a chief security officer, you've got to know a lot of things about a lot of things and you've got to have some, so got to have broad foundational knowledge and understanding in, in a, in a variety of areas. And a, a, a good example is conflict de-escalation. You know, we, we want our security officers to go out and, you know, um, enforce rules. Well, that often, when you're enforcing rules, that often leads to um, conflict. Sure. Because not everybody wants to follow the rules. Both. Right. People, like, look at the, look what's going on right now with just trying to get people to wear masks. Mm. Right. Like, people are, some people are like completely losing it over that. And, um, but, but that's just one example, but rule enforcement it, it ultimately does lead to a fair amount of conflict, whether it's criminal code rules, um, civil code rules, you know, like not, you know, let's say you're not allowed to smoke in a shopping mall and you got to walk up to somebody and say, sorry, but you're going to have to put that cigarette out, you know, or, or, you know, a security officer is expected to go arrest somebody because they're breaking the law or something as simple as rule enforcement for a contractor who's coming in to do work on site and let's say they're having a bad day or they don't want to follow the rules or or they're they you know they're they're in an in an elevated state uh, of anxiety at that point so we expect our security personnel to be able to calmly and professionally deal with uh, uh, rule enforcement and right. conflict the escalation okay well it's it's easy enough to say well let's give you a one or two hour course on conflict de-escalation, which is what the Alberta basic security training program does. There's a, there's a module in there that lasts about an hour, mm -hmm. but in order to de-escalate conflict, you've got to have good communication skills, good verbal communication skills. You've got to have high degrees of emotional intelligence, both self-awareness and self-management and social awareness and social management. You know, if somebody's sitting there and standing in front of you and they're threatening to kill you or they're screaming or they're completely lost control, you've got to be able to handle that situation, right? And then, and in some cases, and, and even though security personnel are not expected in most cases to become physical with somebody, we all know that guards are attacked on a regular basis and, and oh, yeah. they need to know how to defend themselves. For sure. And so they've sure. got to have some, you know, they've got, again, they've got to have verbal de-escalation um, training. They've got to have physical self-defense training. They've got to have uh, the, you know, in many cases with these issues of verbal de-escalation, they've got to be able to write a report. So that means they have to understand both civil and criminal law. They've got to have good written communication skills. Um, there's, there's just a whole, um, wide skill sets required in order to to regularly de-escalate conflict and, and and this is an area where i think we're often sending our security personnel we're almost setting them up for failure mm. and uh there just needs to be higher degrees of training and 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 yeah. conflict de-escalation is just one area you know there's you know, sitting somebody in front of an access control system or video surveillance, throwing them inside a, you know, throwing a security officer into a control room where there's 25 pieces of complex equipment, you know, multiple forms of technology, HVAC and elevator monitoring and lighting controls and access control and communications and video surveillance and help desks and send word now mass communication system, fire alarm systems. We throw them in there and just now oh, they'll just figure it out on their own. Like, like, like they're just, I mean, don't get me wrong. There are some, there are some organizations that do believe in training and, and, and there is a growing understanding of the value of training, but far too often there's not enough training. And on top of that, salaries are not keeping up with the, the expectations of, of what we, what we require of these people. Yeah, I can remember I was a security officer in the in the mid 90s in a, in a hospital in Rhode Island. 
and um, they they took me from I was probably doing like a oh, I, know, I was working in in the emergency room, and then they said, oh, we want you to to uh, do the dispatch, and. I don't know what my training consisted of, but it wasn't that much. And there were a lot of moving parts and, and, you know, you're talking with all these, all these officers and there, yeah, there was, the training was very informal and very brief. Uh, so yeah, it, yeah, it's kind of like, kind of like you're being thrown to the lions, you know, to, to the wolves. Yeah. Well, Hey, I worked in a commercial high rise building and I went from, you know, I was a security officer, a patrol officer. They needed a shift covered in the control room. My training consisted like of about 10 minutes of, of verbal informal training. But I always remember the very first thing that I was taught to do uh, when I when they sat me down in front of the access control system, which I never even knew existed, to be perfectly honest, prior to that, uh, was how to highlight batches of 100 alarms at a time and delete them out of the system without having to acknowledge them. Hmm. You know, okay. um, when I was, when I was first sent to that site, my training consisted of the site supervisor. I first showed up for work, you know, that one, that morning, he took me down to the, it was a, it was a twin story building. And there was a kind of a concourse between the two of them. He took me down and he handed me a set of keys and a radio and said, that's the East tower. This is the West tower. Go figure it out. Nice. And that was that was my training nice you know yeah. um my training theoretically at the bay when we were given loss prevention training consisted of being told to sign a form that we had been trained and when i said to my boss i haven't received any training and what happens if i refuse to sign this form he goes well then you're fired so you can choose sign the form or you're done oh so the form said that you had received the training but you received no training yes. Correct. Chase, man. And so that, that, that was my training. Wow. That's nice. Uh, I got to say though, you know, when I look on LinkedIn and, and, and when I'm managing the, uh, the IFPO uh, social media, I see a lot of security professionals out there and they're, and they're uh, you know, this is, this is a positive here because I see a lot of them are very proud about what they've what they've achieved you know they'll they'll put um you know the various degrees after their name or degrees or, or certifications i and i i like seeing that i'm like this is a go-getter you know uh there, there was a guy um his name is uh i i don't know if i'm pronouncing it correctly retson cores he's from the netherlands he runs a uh, protection company and uh he got a cpo uh, only a couple months ago, and then boom, he got his uh, CSSM. Like that guy's a go-getter, you know. And and um, so I, I think that's fantastic. And I, I so there there is a segment of the security industry where those those you know that that of those people. So that's that's sure, and it it's changing. And I so when I started out in this industry, I. Um, and recognize that there was a career potential here. Quite frankly, when I thought towards the future, I thought we would be further along than where we are right now. Mm. Now, having said that, we have come a long way. And I agree, whenever I go on LinkedIn and I see people posting their credentials, that tells me that we, you know, we have come a long way. Right. We've still got a ways to go, you know. Um, uh, I personally think that I don't care what your background is, you're welcome to come work in the security industry. But if you're going to come work in this industry, then you need to get security industry certification, education and training there. It, it's just um, a myth that you can work in another industry and then come here and claim expertise. It's that's not, that's not a thing. And right. Um, as I said, everybody's welcome to work in this industry they can they though they can get the training like the rest of us and quite frankly if somebody's claiming that they're an expert working from an industry then show me by getting your certification how easily how easy it was to get that certification if you are the expert that you say you are because of your previous experience then getting certification should be a piece of cake right you know right but um 
but it's it's just high time that that uh, that that um, all levels we we have formal tr- minimum formal levels of training and education. And the reason that I keep discuss saying training and education, they are two different things. Okay. Typically, training is knowledge that you gain that's task specific. So if it's, if you want to learn how to operate a fire alarm panel or how to operate an access control system or how to write a report or um, drive a car or how to use handcuffs, that's training. Knowledge is that broader cognitive functioning, which provides you with the, the underpinnings of, of why you should be doing, you know, something. Um, I, I think that, you know, when it comes to doing a risk assessment, that's education. There's a lot of knowledge that, that you need, a person requires in order to figure out how to do a proper risk assessment. That, that um, you know, that the education is that broader foundational underpinnings that teaches you how to think critically it teaches right. you how to put your thoughts in a coherent manner. It um, allows you to see larger patterns and and understand and make decisions, uh, like and see the big picture. And and so that's how I that's how I distinguish between um, training and education. Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, you know, because um, like uh, uh, for example, um, uh, Matthew Parker, who runs uh, Independent Security Advisors, which is a uh, executive protection executive and dignitary protection company he's got the classroom and then he's then he's got the uh like he usually needs for for any training that he runs he's, he needs a classroom and he needs a parking lot so he, so he's got the time in there in, in the classroom where they're where they're going over stuff and then the training i guess the yeah, education and then the training get out in the parking lot let's do a j turn let's do this maneuver that maneuver you know um and and have he has simulated gunshots and the, the whole thing so yeah, that, that makes makes perfect sense. Education and training, you know, like you're saying. Yeah. Well, it, you know what? Let's say when it comes to driving a car, I could watch all the videos in the world about how to drive a car, and I could read a uh, hundred page booklet on the technical aspects of a car. I could look at the owner's manual. I could spend hours and hours and hours reading about the theory of driving a car. Right. You want to teach somebody how to drive a car? Get me in front of the wheel and get me out in the parking lot and have me drive around. There you go. So, yeah. um, you know, the other thing I'm going to say, though, is that like, I, I understand there's a lot of people who are big fans of experience. And, and this is what you're talking about, experience, you know, practical hands-on experience. I am a big believer in experience, too. <clears throat> but I also find that there's a group of people who think that, you can, you can only have experience or education and that somehow they're mutually exclusive. Ah. And a lot of them point to, well, I know academics or I listen to academics and they don't seem to have a practical bone in their body and they don't know anything. And I agree. I, you know what, you know, the universities that I've attended, the fact that I teach, I've met plenty of academics who have no practical bones in their body. And, you know, the the running joke that we've been experiencing societally for the last 10 years has been the big bang theory, right? Dr. Sheldon Cooper, he is this, this brilliant, whatever he is, a physicist or whatever, but he's, you know, socially maladjusted, let's say, who's got no practical experience. And and I somehow think that a lot of people think, well, you can be brilliant and you can be an academic, but you can't have any practical experience. And so I see, I see experience on one end of the spectrum. I see education, formal education on the other end of the spectrum. But in the middle, I see somebody with, with education and experience. Yeah, right. Why, why can't you marry the two? You know? Right. Well, they, they need to be married. And, and, and again, I've had enough experiences with some of these pure academics. I walk away from some of these academics shaking my head, too. I think and you have no idea what the real world is about. None. And... Um, you know, just on that note, the last bit of research that I did was on how security personnel, secure, frontline security officers manage workplace violence. And so I went out, I did a formal academic study and I talked to 20 security personnel and, you know, I did semi-structured interviews 
And my original intent was to get this published in an academic journal and I submitted it for peer review. And, and the feedback that I got was what I considered to be utter nonsense because they wanted, they, they were telling me that I didn't look at this from, the, from a power structure perspective, that the security guards were the ones who with all the power and the people that they, did, they were dealing with were, were, were powerless. And that I didn't incorporate, you know, the communication models. And I just looked at that and I thought, this is utter nonsense. I was looking at this from an occupational health and safety perspective. What it also made me realize was and, and there is, I've seen this, I've, you know, part of the research that I did do was I did look at, there's, there's been three major pieces of research done in Canada, the UK and Australia about security personnel managing violence at work. And they've all been written from the perspective that uh, like from the, from the, in the bouncing industry, like from bouncers. Oh, okay. And the, the general consensus was from these academic researchers was, well, these bouncers were all a bunch of jerks. And so they had it coming to them anyway. And okay. which I obviously completely disagree with, but it also made me realize I don't want to get something published in an academic journal that's going to disappear into obscurity just because I happen to please a couple of academics who I completely disagree with. Mm -hmm. And so I rewrote the article and I thought, you know what? I want frontline security personnel to read my research. I want trainers i want security managers i want contract guard providers i want um clients to read this whether i've made some academic happy because i took into account power dynamics of communication is utterly meaningless to me right right and so and so that's you know I, you know i you know i rewrote that article that research so a you know a security officer or a trainer could go to it and say oh here are you know 10 tips you can do to de-escalate conflict or you know this is something that we can plow into our training program mm -hmm. and so oh, again you know i i understand the criticisms that people have about the academic community because i have the exact same criticisms about them you know um yeah. sure but by the same token, I, I firmly believe we do. We need research. We need formal academic research. It's it is an absolute must. As far as I'm concerned, though, there must be some practical applications about it, mm -hmm. or that that comes out as a result of the research. And right. I, I mean, can have, what's the, what's the sense in the research if it's not used in some in some way to uh, hopefully improve something? I agree. And to be perfectly honest, and, and I will say in my limited understanding and interaction, I will say that some academic research is nothing but, you know, an academic exercise to further somebody's ego and, mm -hmm. and quite frankly, to get published, because that's, that is certainly a requirement in the academic world, you know, right, in the you research world, You're constantly getting published. Right. And, and you know, that I have this ongoing debate with a friend of mine about the value of academic research. And again, I firmly believe in it, but I really firmly believe that it needs to have practical implications. And I've been subscribing to various academic journals in the security world for over 20 years now. I will say, though, the limited practical information that I've pulled out of those, like it, it, it is limited. I mean, I've read hundreds of academic articles and i will say that like the practical information that i've been able to pull out of that stuff where i've actually been able to apply that it's it's minuscule mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. so the question i have is well like why are these people doing this research because it, it doesn't it in so many cases it doesn't bring any practical tangible knowledge and you know you know when i worked for that property management company you know, I, I was constantly reading all these academic articles, but it was just rarely that I could that I could use something out of there on a on a day to day basis. You know, hmm. like probably the one that comes to mind is around ergonomics of control rooms. Like there has been some terrific research into that in the last several years because people are starting to recognize that you just can't throw a bunch of used furniture that you pull out of the dumpster 
um, and throw it into a tiny little cubby hole in a, in a building um, and then put some security officers in there and think that, and then put a million dollars worth of technical, um, you know, equipment, computers in there, and then use a, a busted chair or a busted desk. And then yeah. think those security personnel are actually going to sit there and monitor those cameras or pay attention. And so there's been some, as I said, there's been some fantastic research into ergonomics and how to actually build a proper control room. Hmm. That's, okay. that's terrific practical knowledge yeah. that's of value, but just so much of the research out there is it just, I don't see where it can be applied. Now I, I also get it that research it's tough. It's hard to do. Ultimately you can spend weeks, months, or years working on a very specific tiny piece of research. And all it may end up giving you is one brick in a vast wall mm -hmm. that will provide some foundational knowledge on ultimately leading to some practical implementation. So, so I'm not, I'm not saying, shut down this research. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying that, um, well, it's a complex issue and I, I would just like to see more practical knowledge come out of all this research that's being done. So speaking of practical things, um, let's talk about, uh, or in closing here, somebody who wants to be a security officer, what, what would you tell them? What would be your advice to them as far as how they should properly get off on the right foot in the, uh, in the industry? Well, oh, that's a really broad question and it really depends on the jurisdiction, right? I mean, lots of, so there's global, if we, if we look at this from a global perspective, there's three kinds of training out there. There's non-existent training, there's bad training and there's good training. Okay. Many jurisdictions around the world have no training whatsoever. Right. Um, just training is legislation around the training, right? Um, cause it's typically legislation that requires training to be undertaken. So, right. Right. um, so anyway, there's, and that, you know, I mean, you take it there, there are, there are States in the United States where either you don't require any training whatsoever to be licensed or training is, is four hours of training. Okay. Four hours is not enough to prepare anybody to do anything as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, no. So. Um, but Canada, I mean, so we've got, you know, we've got, we've got six of our 10 provinces that have mandatory training, but that training only consists ranges from 40 to 56 hours of training. That's not enough to prepare for somebody for work in the industry either. So to go back to answer your question and, and you know, and it's, and it's, it's inconsistent. There's countries in Europe where you have, there are countries in Europe where you have to have over 300 hours of training. So anyway, you're asking me about, you know, a career in the security industry and how to prepare. First thing is you got to find out what the local, what the local legislation is, get that, you know, obtain that minimum amount of training. Second thing though, that I would do is that, you know, going to work for either an in-house or a contract employer, take all the training that you can get your hands on, right? Yeah. Everything that they offer, as long as it's good training, you know, and, and it, it, Eventually, you're going to figure out what is good training and what's not good training. But I also think that people need to take responsibility for their own careers. And so they need to pursue training on their own. Yeah. And, and I get it. You know what? If you're working in, a, in an area where security personnel are making minimum wage and you also got to live and you might have to support a family, that, uh, that might be hard. But, you know, if you do want a career in the security industry... I would say that you want to take, you know, take as much training as you, as you can, recognizing that there, there is a, you know, take the big picture here and there is a career within this industry. Um, look up and get information from a variety of sources and try to make yourself as, you know, like, you know, try to expose yourself to as much training and education as you can on a regular basis. And uh, one of the, th so bit of a segue here, one of the things that I've developed because I feel that there there's been a huge gap in the security industry. And one of the things that we do very poorly is 
it, we're not letting people know in the industry that that this is a career and uh, we're not we're not informing them on you know the very question you've asked is well so how do i go from one how do i become a security officer and how and two how do i become a good security officer right but then where can i go from here like like i want to become a supervisor what do i got to do to become a supervisor and, and then a manager and then a or an assistant manager then a manager and then what about a senior manager what happens if i want to be a, a a control room supervisor or you know, if I want to be an investigator, or if I want to be a physical security specialist, or if I want to be, ultimately, my goal is to become the chief security officer for an organization. How do I do that? Right. So as a result, I, I created a, a table. Uh, I'm, on, I'm on version eight right now. And it's a, it's a career pathing plan and task complexity. And what I've done is basically divided that into two main categories, which is what are the requirements of the job and what skills do I need to bring to that job in order to be successful? And so I, I've actually posted that on LinkedIn, but I'm, I'm also happy to send you that document. Yeah, please do. I, and, I'll, I'll uh, definitely post I mean, it on, on the IFPO.org. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Well, that's, to be honest, that's actually going to be one of the topics that I'm going to talk about in 2021 with, with, um, oh, with your webinar series, series of webinars. Is, is going to be around career planning. Oh, nice. You nice. know, um, and uh, so where was I going with this? So, so yeah, it's just to give people food for thought about, you know, where can I go with this? Where can I go with this job? What, what are the, what, are, you know, what education do I need? What training? Uh, what are the requirements of the job? And hopefully those two can be married and it'll give insight into individuals on how they can progress in their careers. Right. And to let people know that it is in fact a career and not just something that you might do for six months, but that, you know, that you can make a life out of it. You can make. A Absolutely. Career. You know, what? I, like one of the things that I've, that struck me, so I'm, I'm in my 31st year, I think working in the security industry there are a lot of terrific, really hardworking and educated and knowledgeable people working in this industry at every level. There's really a lot of great, great people in this industry. Mm -hmm. And I, I also think though that this job is, is societally grossly underrated. I mean, you know, it's, you know, in, in pop culture, it's, it, it's, sure. it's viewed yeah. very derogatorily. Right. Yeah. But I, uh, I don't think the average citizen could do this job. They, they really couldn't, they, they wouldn't have the aptitude and they wouldn't have the skills. And, you know, they're, you know, and they're, again, you know, pop culture, they always show security people are just a bunch of losers who can't get a job anywhere else. And, yeah. Paul Blart, mall cop and, and all well, that. that. Kevin James did such a disservice to the security industry with that horrible, horrible movie. And, uh, but I mean, even I, I mean, I, I face it and, I don't know if you face it or not, but I know a lot of the people that I that I work with regularly face it when they simply say to somebody, I work in the security industry. They don't say, hey, I work, you know, I'm head of corporate security or I work for the city and I do this or I'm a physical security specialist or I'm a project manager or I'm a systems designer. If they just say I work in the security industry, like they just get more often than not, they just get treated with contempt. Contempt, or do they, do they get laughed at, or ridiculed? Um, well, I've never had anybody laugh at me in my face, but <laughs> um, I'm a pretty big guy. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> but I've seen the dismissal and the eye rolls. Ah, know? yeah. Okay. Um, and the the change in attitude is when I say I work in the security industry. Oh, really? Oh, really? Like you know, like bad for you. <laughs> oh yeah it's oh i'm sorry i'm sorry you're not successful in life <laughs> oh jeez. like I, I i yeah i i've gotten that a lot and I, yeah it's but as i said the average person i don't think could do this job mm. they just and then the higher up you go the more complex it becomes and you need a lot of skills in a lot of different areas and I, I, I love this job. I love this occupation. I love this industry. And I look forward to the day when we do have minimum standards at every level. And um, 
to be perfectly honest, I, I'm tired of being treated like a second class citizen in my own industry by people who don't know anything about security industry who think they're security experts. Uh, yeah. um, or again, have that that expectation because they watch Paul Blart Mall Cop that somehow if you've worked in security that you're just not a success. So, yeah. Um, well, it, it's a great industry. Yeah. And, and you know, Glenn, you're doing a lot to, to help turn that around. And, and hopefully uh, we here at the IFPO and then also the uh, the research that uh, is, is going to be uh, forthcoming from uh, Perpetuity Research in the UK. Hopefully that that all will uh, combine and, and contribute, you know, to elevating. And we can have a real profession, you know. Yeah, and I, you know, and I, you know, I firmly believe that research needs to be done because one of the big concerns I have, to be honest, is this um, the rise of private military groups. Mm. Oh, and, right. You, you, I think you did a webinar on that. Yeah, I did. I, you know, with Martin Gill at Perpetuity Consulting, and you know, he asked me to be a guest host, and I did a topic on uh, that was the topic. And my concern is that there are a lot of people who conflate the private security industry with private military companies uh, who, okay. who think they're the same thing. And unfortunately, in some countries, they are the same thing. Mm. And uh, the concern I have is that eventually, either nationally or internationally, legislation is going to come out that's going to control that industry. And at the same time, there's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to have a huge adverse effect on, on the private security industry. And I think by doing this research, this is an opportunity for us to, for us to stake a claim as to what security personnel actually do. Hmm. Yeah, no, that, that the way you put it there, that, yeah, that's very important. I wasn't kind of wasn't aware of the gravity of, of, of that, uh, but I'll have to go back and watch the, uh, watch the webinar. Yeah, there's, you know, what, and I was lucky. I, I got four guest speakers from, you know, France, Russia, United Arab Emirates and England. Uh, four subject matter experts that brought a lot of value. But I do a lot of reading in this, and there there is a lot of academic research into private military companies. There there really is, and uh, like one of the problems is that there is no consistent, agreed upon definition of what a private military company is. Hmm. And so, and they're also referred to, you know, people. Some people call them mercenaries. They, some call them, call them private military companies. Some people call them private security companies. Right. It, it, so right. there's there's a lot of mixing of terms. So gotcha. Well, Glenn, anyway, uh, it's, yeah, I, I just I, I wanted to to thank you for uh, for your time. I, I really appreciate it. I, I thought this was very worthwhile. I think uh, you know um, people will get a lot out of it. You know, um, watching it, listening to it. Um, I, I hope so. And uh, yeah, again, you know, again, I mean, I guess my final thoughts are that I think it's a fantastic industry with a lot of really good people in it a lot of really hard-working caring people and uh, fantastic career opportunities and uh, you know I again I, I I you know I welcome anybody and everybody to work in this industry I just think they need to have education and training security education and training uh, yeah that, I mean that makes perfect sense it really does yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So I appreciate the uh, opportunity to speak this morning. Yeah. Thanks so much, Glenn. And yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll definitely have to do it again. And, um, and yeah, you'll, you'll have to send me the, uh, the information on the, um, it was the career path. Yes. We we're talking about. Yeah. Great. All right. Talk to you soon, Glenn. You bet. Thank you very much.